this. When I say announcements, that sounds more important than it really is. I'm just gonna cover a couple of housekeeping details, but I'll wait till a few more people get here. Hi, Sharon Baker. Hi, Sharon Rodman. The Sharons are here in force tonight. Hi, Mary Nakasoni, our plant sale coordinator for the CPS Central Puget Sound chapter. I see a lot of names that I recognize because I enter people's memberships into the database, but I, we haven't been properly introduced. So I'm too shy to say hi. Hi, Gary Room. Hi, Don Schachtel. Okay, we're at 126, it's 7.02. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Elizabeth Gage. I'm the Office and Volunteer Coordinator for WNPS and CPS. And uh, somebody has just asked a question in the chat box, will we be um, offering a recording, and we will. It will be available tomorrow night. Um, it is being recorded. I see the little red button on. And um, some nice people said hello back to me. So the other uh, housekeeping thing I wanted to cover is that um, we'll be monitoring the chat box and the Q&A um, for questions as we go along. So both our speaker, Brian Harvey, and I will be keeping an eye on the chat box. So go ahead and ask questions as you think of them, and we will try to get them answered. So now I'm going to introduce Yanka Hobbs, who's our chair of the board of the Central Puget Sound chapter who will welcome you and have a couple more announcements. And I'm going to disappear. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our East Tide subchapter February um, presentation, which I am very much looking forward to seeing. And um, we are Let's see, I guess, I guess our chapter announcements are that um, we are planning to have a spring plant sale and um, it will be held, um, it will be an order online um, pickup, um, no, con no contact pickup um, type sale. And we will have a website with um, plant descriptions and um, inventory, which should be up um, sometime in early April. And then we will have a pickup um, date sometime in um, prob probably um, Mother's Day weekend. We haven't um, quite got all the details um, worked out yet, but that is going to happen. Thank you, Ma thank you, Mary Nakasoni, for stepping stepping in to be um, plant sale coordinator. Um, we are also looking forward to, in this sort of similar timeline, um, April will indeed be a Native Plant Appreciation Month, and there will be um, lots of um, Zoom presentations, and we are hoping to. Um, by then have a few small in-person um, offerings as well. But again, those are still in flux. Anyway, um, I will introduce Cheryl Wagner, who is the um, 
East Side subchapter um, program person. And she will tell you more about the program and introduce our speaker. Thank you, thank you for showing up everybody and I'm looking forward to this. Thanks, Yanka. My name is Cheryl and I am delighted to introduce Dr. Brian Harvey. He's assistant professor at the UW School of Environmental and Forest Sciences. And in several of his current projects, he is working with collaborators, um, partners, and graduate students to understand the drivers and patterns of forest fires in our Western Cascades and how our forests are responding to these fires. I think you're going to talk a lot about Norse Peak fire, possibly also in this. So thank you again for sharing your knowledge. Really appreciate it, Brian. Yeah, thank you, Cheryl. <clears throat> and thank you to everyone for the opportunity to come and speak with you tonight. And I really do want to, um, from the start, set this up as, as much of an interactive talk as possible and talk a little bit about um, kind of some background of the basic setting the scene of, of forest fires in Cascadia and then um, specifically dive into some of the <clears throat> recent work that we're working on um, looking at fires on the west side of the Cascades, but we won't forget about fires on the on the east side of the Cascades as well. So just a quick sound check. Any any problems? Everyone can hear me okay and see the slides okay before I, I dive in here. A thumbs up or a okay in the chat or something like that just to make sure. It all looks good to me. Okay, great. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, all right, so yeah, as, as Cheryl mentioned, um, my name is Brian Harvey. I am in my fourth year uh, on the faculty at UW in the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences. And um, I study forest ecology, fire ecology, uh, disturbances in forests, so how fire interacts with other things like bark beetle outbreaks, um, and do a lot of research mostly focused on Western <clears throat> North American conifer forests. And uh, I'm particularly excited to talk about some of the work in Washington today. So this topic of forest fires <clears throat> really anywhere um, on the planet right now is probably one that does not need a lot of introduction. And I say that as crazy as it may sound, um, you know, in, in many years by this time, we've been many months since the fire season and the news cycles go so quickly that we kind of forget about <clears throat> the last year's fire season. That's getting a little bit easier to assume at this point that people's memory is still fresh with last year's fire season because we are continuing to see some pretty big whoppers of fire years back to back and sometimes um, over a stretch of years. And so this is just to, to kind of bring us back to, um, I believe when, the, when we first started talking about doing this talk, it was right on the heels of the September fires on the West Coast. And this two images here, <clears throat> one looking down from space at the fire, active fires burning in red here and the smoke blowing out over the Pacific Ocean, which we'll talk a little bit about specifically in terms of why that's important and how that works um, later on in the talk. But I just wanna you know, let this image set in for a second and recognize that if we were looking at this as an image of cumulative fire activity over multiple years, we'd probably say, wow, that's a lot of fire activity. But remember that these were all fires burning at one single point in time in September of this past fall. And that's what it looked like from space <clears throat> up and down the West Coast. And you can see we narrowly escaped um, the most extreme manifestation of that fire activity in Washington, but not all of it. There's the, the big hollow fire in the Gifford Control National Forest. And on the ground, that was a pretty, um, a pretty exciting and terrifying scene, depending on where you were. Now this photograph, I think most people think, whoa, the Golden Gate Bridge, that looks insane. Um, 
that was not the Golden Gate Bridge, but was a bridge over Lake Oroville in California, <clears throat> um, demonstrating how close these fires were to a lot of people. This is very close to several communities in and around Lake Oroville in California. And we were affected by fires in many profound ways as a society last summer. And so I just wanna um, say that from the outset, I'm gonna be talking about fire ecology and forest ecology in this talk, but um, not lose sight of the fact that these affected us in very profound ways and many dimensions of our lives. <clears throat> And so in, in this talk this evening, I'm um, going to be setting things up, talking a little bit about fire in Pacific Northwest forests. Quickly start with what is probably the most familiar area of fire in most of our minds, and that's fire on the east side and fre frequent fire forests. Um, and it's easy to quickly turn all of our attention to the west side with the fires that happened this last year and forget about the fact that um, fire is a very frequent occurrence on the east side and has some particularly interesting management challenges associated with it. Then um, take us over on this side of the Cascades on the west side where I'm currently sitting right now in Seattle and talk about <clears throat> um, fire on the west side in the context of what we saw this last summer and then zoom out a little bit and, and look at some trends um, both regionally and uh, continental and even globally and ask ourselves what might we expect as the world continues to warm in terms of fire and Pacific Northwest forests and forests elsewhere. So starting with those images from last summer, which I showed a minute ago, <clears throat> it's easy for us to get the idea that fire is a recent and um, ultimately only terrifying event for society in our region. But it's really, really critical for us to take a second and remember <clears throat> that fire is something that has played an important and very critical role in these landscapes for a very long time. Hey, bud, I need you to be quiet. Okay. Um, sorry, that's my five year old son, Joaquin, who's also in attendance tonight. Um, Fire has played a very important and critical role, not only in shaping the plants that we know and love around these landscapes, but also the people that have been here for a very long time since humans have occupied the Americas. <clears throat> and on the left hand side, we're looking at um, a plant species that uh, this particular species does not occur in Washington, but this trait, this adaptive trait of serotony certainly occurs in Washington in lodgepole pine. And it is just one of many fire adapted traits that gives us a very clear indication of the role that fire has played over evolutionary timescales. So we're talking millions of years on this continent. If we flip over to the map on the right hand side, um, also important to remember that there has been a relationship between humans and fire on this continent for at least the last 10,000 years and that that relationship varies quite a bit across space and in particular fire regimes um, in, in different ways from other fire regimes. <clears throat> and so again just really important to set the scene that fire has been around for a long time. It's not new to this landscape though what we are seeing may be new to our eyes and we may be seeing new dynamics unfolding certainly. All right, now I'm gonna start with a trivia question here, which is kind of a fun way to start it off. Um, we can use the chat box here for people to type in some guesses here, but uh, start with this slide. And I just wanna show this map of the state of Washington really quick. These areas outlined in red are all the fire activity summed up in terms of area burn. These are all the perimeters of fires that occurred from 1984, which um, there's nothing magic about that year other than that's the year that our satellite that we use to map fire activity um, very routinely went up into space. And 2017 is the last time I've updated this particular atlas here. But let's just imagine these numbers would pretty much stay stable until this last summer. What percent of fire in Washington would you guess occurred west of the Cascade Crest? This dashed line right here is the Cascade Crest. You can see clearly most of it is on the east side of the Cascades, but all right, 
approximately 1%, 1%, 3%, 2%, 2%, less than five. Whoa, too many numbers to count. Okay, great, we're getting in the ballpark. Um, wow, okay, someone got really close. Um, I, I always feel like I'm, I'm giving an answer on an infomercial. I'm trying to sell you something in hyperbole here when I say this real number, but the real number is less than one-tenth of one percent of fire activity occurred in the last three decades on the west side of the Cascades, or in other words, greater than 99.9% .9 of fire activity has occurred on the east side of the Cascades. And that is um, totals of area burned, right? So we can measure fire activity in, in other ways as well, but that's a usually a pretty common metric to think about area burned. So it's very easy for us to get the idea looking at something like this in our map, in our recent memory, um, that fire is something that is a phenomenon that plays a role on the east side of the Cascades and isn't really something that's part of these landscapes on the west side of the Cascades or part of these plant communities on the west side of the Cascades. Um, certainly, <clears throat> by lots of measures, that's a long-term record, right? We're talking about uh, more than 30 years of, of data right there. but you really need to rewind the clock to start thinking about fire on the west side of the Cascades. And if we could do that with this map, and instead of looking at 1984, go back several hundred or even thousands of years, <clears throat> we would find that fire is very much a part of forests and forested landscapes on the west side of the Cascades. It just has a very different relationship. And that relationship is, it comes around much less frequently. So in our three uh, most dominant forest zones on the west side of the Cascades, we've got Western Hemlock in the, the low slopes of the Cascades, Pacific Silver Fir in the mid slopes, and Mountain Hemlock in the upper slopes. <clears throat> and as you can see, uh, we as we go up in elevation, that fire rotation or essentially the time required to burn the entire landscape of the West Cascades goes up from several hundred years to almost a millennium. And when we, one way to think about this is uh, where fire occurs or historically occurred relatively frequently on the order of every few years to decades in a given patch of forest on the east side of the Cascades, in a given patch of forest on the west side of the Cascades, Fire occurred every several hundred years to sometimes approaching a thousand years. And so it's important for us to first, when talking about fire in Washington, <clears throat> really hammer home one key point, And that is that fire in the Cascades is a very different phenomenon with very different management contexts and even with very different um, histories and likely futures, whether we're talking about fire in the eastern half of the Cascades or the western half of the Cascades. So I'm gonna set this up at the beginning here by talking a little bit about those contrasts before we dive into the western Cascades piece here. We do have a quick uh, question, whether the small percent on the west side is also the case when the Native Americans were managing the landscape using fire. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, let me go back to that slide really quick. Uh, our, I would say one, one way to answer that question <clears throat> is that there is still um, less of a concrete understanding in the fire ecology literature about the role that humans have played in the West Side fire regime relative to the east side. And, and a big piece of that is purely just um, the fire regimes themselves. We know that fire was, was like all of the ingredients for fire to be more frequent are there on the east side of the Cascades and are less so on the west side of the Cascades. Um, there's also <clears throat> a lot more opportunities um, to manage fire in, in a, a more tame way over broader spatial scales on the east side than on the west side. Um, so there is more of a question mark in terms of 
the role that humans played, at least in the broad scale fire regime on the west side. Certainly there's lots of, um, lots of evidence and continuing today practices of fire as a management tool on the west side of the Cascades that date back um, to uh, tens, you know, thousands of years going back over the last 10,000 years. Um, but the, the, the role that it played in terms of these fire rotations is, is less well understood. And I'll, I'll get um, a little bit more into that when we talk about the, the dynamics of fire and, and forest succession on the west side. But it is a it is a really good question, and I would say that, that that's something that um, is part of our our current research with some partners right now is trying to get a better understanding of the exact role that um, humans have and continue to play in this fire regime, where we just have less evidence of fire activity than we do um, in the more frequent fire east side. D does that help in answering that question for right now? Before we move on. I think so. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and, and let me know. Um, I'll, I'll I'll try to come back to that, but let me know if if there are other dimensions of that that I'm not um, I'm not covering that would be useful. Okay. So <clears throat> before we do this, I, I just want to set up a couple terms that we we throw around pretty uh, quick and loose in the fire ecology lingo here. Um, but just a really quick slide for fire ecology 101 here. So I'll be talking a lot about the fire regime on the east side and the west side. I think I've already used that term uh, many times. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with that. Others, uh, may, maybe less so. So basically, that breaks down to the characteristics of fire and, and, and what it plays over um, long spatial and temporal scales. Basically, how often does fire occur? How big are fires when they do occur? And how severe are they? What's the ecological effect? Are they fires that basically just kill some plants and, and leave many surviving? Um, or are they fires that are stand replacing and kill most of the above ground vegetation? Um, so we'll be talking a little bit about the fire regime and those dimensions of it and how that differs on the east side versus the west side. And basically, those regimes are a product of the controls or drivers of that regime. And we can think about the ingredients for fire to occur boiling down to fuels necessary to burn, weather and climate conditions that are conducive to getting those fuels burning, and some ignition source on the landscape, whether that's um, an intentional or unintentional human-caused ignition or a lightning-caused ignition on the landscape. Um, I Really quick, I, I, I've got the chat here, and there's a really good comment about um, the yeah the difference in where even on the west side where there was more of a presence of um, indigenous uh, use of fire as a management tool intentionally, um, and how that varied across the landscape. So we'll, we'll come back to that for sure, um, and how it differs among the Puget lowlands versus um, areas that were burned for huckleberry fields um, or the more broad landscape of um, forests on the, on the west side of the Cascades. Certainly varied spatially even within each of these fire regimes. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go to the east side really quick and imagine we were um, standing on this ridge, which is in the Mission Creek area just outside of uh, kind of between Clee Elm and Leavenworth on uh, Blewett Pass, uh, more or less, and the, the low elevation below Blewett Pass. And we can imagine that any given uh, day out on the east side of the Cascades in any given summer is obviously going to be relatively warm and dry. And uh, in these forests, sorry, let me go back one slide real quick. Um, we're mostly, I'm going to mostly focus on sort of the poster child of the east side low elevation forest, the ponderosa pine forest, so dominated by um, ponderosa pine with its uh, thick bark characteristic and, and interesting fire adaptation that we'll get to in a second here. <clears throat> and in that fire regime, uh, there would have been plenty, plenty of ignitions from lightning caused ignitions and human uh, intentional or unintentional ignitions uh, for very long times on the, the east side of the Cascades 
as well as weather and climate conditions that any given summer, you'd be able to get a fire going on the east side. It's probably not too hard to imagine that um, during most summer days on the east side of the Cascades. However, what would have been limiting to fire because of those two things being rel relatively readily available is the fuels. It, we, we consider this a fuel limited system. And essentially what we mean by that is when you have ingredients for fire lined up like this, you've got the opportunity for fire to be coming through relatively frequently. And each time it does, it would have removed a lot of fuel. Fires um, in their either killing uh, of live vegetation or consumption of dead vegetation and fuels on the ground remove a lot of that fuel when they're coming through. And so when we're talking about a uh, fire regime towards the lower elevation of the Wenatchee Mountains, like I just showed you by Mission, Mission Creek area, um, think of a fire regime on the order of every few years to decades in most patches of forest. And because they would have been coming through relatively frequently, they would have been fairly low severity fires. They wouldn't have built up a lot of intensity to therefore kill a lot of the above ground um, trees at least, and even some of the shrubs would have survived in a fire regime like that. Consequently, the plants that have uh, evolved in that fire regime have lots and lots and lots of adaptations for surviving that kind of fire, relatively frequent but low severity fire. <clears throat> and so again, the poster child of that is something like Ponderosa pine, which we've got lots of, um, and we're just looking at a few examples in this image right here. Hang on one second. Hey, what did, what did you say? What did you can, say? Can you... Sorry about that. It sounded like there was a wrestling match going on in my son's room above the office that I'm sitting in right now. Um, okay, back to fire, <laughs> uh, fire adaptations. Uh, Ponderosa pine in some cases on these really large ponderosa pines can have bark that is up to a foot thick. Really great for insulating against uh, fire when it comes through in this kind of a regime. And, and those trees were able to survive multiple fires because of that bark. And occasionally they would get uh, some cambium killed by that fire. And each time that cambium then subsequently burned, it would have recorded a fire scar. And that would have eventually resulted in what we call cat faces or these very large fire scars that go up on one side of the tree, typically on the uphill side of the tree where fuels would have accumulated um, and burned for a little bit longer time when a fire would have come through. And so we've got plants adapted to that. We've got frequent fires coming through. Historically, the forest structure on the east side would have been relatively open. And then many times we refer to this as a woodland structure as opposed to a forest structure because we would have actually had more open canopy than closed canopy over um, a certain extent, you know, a couple acres of a patch of forest, for example. And when fires would have come through, essentially we would have had a forest structure in a cartoonish um, science illustration drawing here, like that photo I just showed you, this one by Bob Van Pelt in 2007. And this fire regime would have looked like something like this at time zero, if we could just imagine it going, you know, going back to some point where this fire regime was intact, pressing play at time zero. 20 years later, a fire would come through and would have killed some trees, but not killed most of the larger trees that would have survived that fire. And then another 20 years later, it would look similar to what it looked like in that first photograph. Maybe another 20 years later, another fire comes through, kills some trees again. So um, way less than 100% mortality in terms of these trees being killed on this landscape. And if you just imagine we just keep doing that um, well into the future after pressing play on this fire regime, 80 years later uh, with this fire regime operating like this, we would have imagine something like this in terms of a forest structure. So still quite a bit open, um, very high understory 
um, plant diversity with lots of plants that would be themselves adapted to either resprouting or reseeding following those relatively frequent fires. And then again, a forest canopy that's composed mostly of these thick bark fire resistant ponderosa pines. If we were to zoom in to one of those trees, um, it's gonna give us the evidence of what that fire regime looked like. And so this is a, a, a close up of one of those fire scars. If we took a cross section of this ponderosa pine, <clears throat> And now we're looking at the annual rings in that tree through a combination of dendrochronology of figuring out what calendar year each of those annual rings corresponds to with fire ecology, looking at these um, deep cut fire scars each time a fire came through here, we could come up with the local fire history for that tree and do that in a bunch of trees around that and come up with a construction of what that fire regime looked like. And in fact, that, that is one of the key pieces of evidence that we have um, that, that really is helpful in reconstructing uh, the natural range of variability or fire regime in these areas, including um, the time uh, prior to Euro-American colonization and um, when there would have been indigenous populations playing a key role in that fire regime over pretty broad spatial scales. And so it's pretty cool. If, if, if we were able to have this talk in person, I would have brought one of these in and we could have passed it around in the audience and looked at the actual calendar <clears throat> dates of some of these fire scars on these trees. So we know the story pretty well on the east side. Um, Smokey Bear was pretty effective at um, uh, an advertisement, advertisement campaign for suppressing fires. And even prior to that, we've had fire exclusion, both through um, the, the forced removal of a lot of the initial um, inhabitants of these lands. And basically what we've got now is at least 100 years in many areas of effective fire exclusion or suppression. So the removal of uh, fire from the landscape or quick suppression of fire on the landscape when it has when fires do start. And so if we were to look at those fire records, this is a really key piece of evidence that goes back in calendar years. This is a study from Emily Heyerdahl, who's a um, when she was um, doing her grad work at UW. Um, and this shows us from several sites in Eastern Oregon and Eastern Washington, <clears throat> um, each one of these lines on this graph is an individual tree that has a tree ring record going back in time. Each one of the vertical black dashes is a fire scar on that tree. And so we can see lots and lots of fire activity on these trees and some years when there was very widespread fire activity because we have multiple trees and sometimes multiple trees across multiple sites that all recorded fire in those same calendar years. I'm going to interrupt with a couple of questions from the Q&A. Yeah, yeah um, let's do it. One person is, Frank Sanborn is asking how much of the original forest on the west side is the same as it was 150 years ago? On, uh, is that on, on the west side or on the east side? Just to on make the sure. West, he wrote on the west side. On the west side. Um, in turn, I guess that, that it's a good question. It could be answered in a couple different ways. Um, if we're thinking about that in terms of old growth forests, um, it's a fairly small percentage of what was uh, probably there prior to at least the last hundred years if we're thinking about um, the total you know forested area in terms of the species that would be there and um, you know the forest zones being occupied um, that's still a pretty high percentage of of what is that what's currently there versus what was there um, say 100 or, or 200 years ago in terms of like the overall forest and extent though the farther back we go in time um, that gets a little bit trickier and, and changes quite a bit in terms of the species composition. Um, in some areas, uh, for example, that we have Douglas fir Western Hemlock Forest now and have had for several centuries, 
Um, if we go back to the early Holocene, those areas would have been drier and would have been Douglas fir forests, or in some cases, even um, lodgepole pine or um, pine oak forests in, in some locations. Okay, thank you. And the, the other question is from Teresa Skaggs. How did you take that cross section showing the burned rings? Oh, great question. Um, these are, so it, it's, <laughs> I remember the first time I was learning about this and the question in my head was, wait, isn't that gonna hurt the tree? Because this is coming from a live tree. Um, I should say that. The easiest way and the, the most um, non-intrusive way to do it is you can get these from dead trees and get, you know, create, cut a cross section with a chainsaw from a dead tree and create that um, tree ring record as well as fire scar record. Obviously, once a tree is dead, that's going to start to um, decay and you're going to lose that record at some point through time. And so um, most of these uh, fire history records often come from live trees. And what's really kind of cool about it, and to answer that, that question that I had when I first started learning about these things of wouldn't this kill the tree, is uh, you're only removing a small section of the live tree cambium actually. And so this entire um, cavity right here is all cambium that has been sealed off and around that the tree is continuing to grow and where it's going to continue to record those fire scars is actually only a small section essentially right around here that you would cut out a very small wedge from that tree. And so by doing that, um, you're only, it's only a very small percentage of the total circumference of the cambium. And so it's, it's a fairly negligible uh, injury to the tree um, to be able to get that information. And the, and the tree will heal over that scar relatively quickly as well in the same uh, physiological way that it does on the, the scar itself. It will essentially um, seal off that tissue and stop growing in that location where that has been removed. Clearly, you wouldn't want to do that all the way around the tree, or you'd essentially be girdling it. So you want to be pretty mindful of a small section that you're taking that from. Great, thank you. Yeah, these are great questions. Keep them coming. And, and certainly, yeah, um, let me know if anything is confusing or I'm, or I'm moving too fast on something. OK, so back at this slide from Emily Herdell's work, it, it shows us that um, very clearly, we've got lots of missing fire activity over the last hundred years and, and continues even beyond that now. This, this study was in 2001. And so when we've removed that fire activity from the east side fires, <clears throat> we've removed that um, natural and human assisted fuel reduction program that we had through the natural fire regime. And we've got changes to forest structure that look something like this. And I, I wanna point out a couple interesting and important things in this, this photograph here, which is from the Mission Creek uh, study site, which is one of our, our study sites on the east side of the Cascades. In a lot of these landscapes, we've still got these large ponderosa pine trees that are fire resistant, at least to a certain extent, and they're still on the landscape but they are no longer um, in a open structure where the fire around them would have been relatively low intensity. And instead they are now crowded by lots of shrubs and shade tolerant trees. We've got Douglas fir and grand fir growing up in and around these trees now. And in many cases, we've got biomass and corresponding fuel loads that are two to three times the historical amount in these east side, uh, low elevation, frequent fire forests. <clears throat> and so this presents a really challenging context because uh, when fire occurs now in these locations, if the fuel structure looks like this, it's not likely to be that low severity fire that these trees have adapted to. It's instead likely to be a high severity fire, sometimes, um, Another word we call for that is a crown fire if it's burning up into the crown of these trees. And so instead of that low severity surface fire, we've got a high intensity, high severity crown fire that would cause uh, in some cases, and in many cases, stand replacing 
mortality, which is not something that these uh, a lot of the, the species in, in these forests have evolved to on the on the east side at least. And so fires that we see today, this is a photograph of um, the Carlton complex, which is one of the large fires on the east side. And the concern is that if we if these areas burn with their current fuel load that has accumulated over the last hundred years, that we could be seeing near or complete mortality of the overstory trees, including those otherwise fire resistant ponderosa pine trees. And so the real challenge on the east side and the context that I'm sure lots of us are familiar with is that <clears throat> we've got a, a, a pretty wicked um, task at hand. And that is that historically forest structures look like this is now looking like this over pretty wide swaths of land. And we've got a little bit of a race against the clock to get these forest structures back to some state that is gonna be resistant or resilient to fire before fire comes and burns in something like this, where it's gonna be outside of the, um, the capacity of resilience for a ponderosa pine tree in a situation like this. And so there's lots and lots of effort <clears throat> uh, throughout dry frequent fire forests in the West. And this is just a, a map showing that from some work by some colleagues, um, this led by Tom DeMeo at the Forest Service, showing that if we look at where the fire regimes, and this is a little bit of a, um, a nod to where we're going next on the West side, where the fire regimes are most uh, departed from their natural uh, fire frequency, um, forest structure condition, we're seeing that in the red and orange colors. So pretty consistently in the low elevation band and in the um, northeastern part of Washington, as well as in um, eastern Oregon on the Cascades and in the Blue Mountains, uh, those are the areas that are most departed from their historical structure. And in terms of the restoration need or the amount of disturbance um, or disturbance-like activity to get those forests back to a more resilient structure is really high in these landscapes, particularly relative to Western uh, Washington and Western slope of the Cascades here. Again, this is now percentage of disturbance need by watershed here, and we can see the areas that are red correspond not surprisingly to the areas that are red here, which is um, very high departures from their historical fire regime. I have a question from Steve Richmond. He wants to know if logging roads help to slow fires as a fire break, or do they fragment forests and make them more susceptible to fire? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and I'm going to give you the, the true and holy um, unsatisfying answer to that question, which is it depends. <laughs> And um, what I mean by that is um, roads certainly, uh, you know, at some level are going to fragment forests and are going to have <clears throat> any of the, um, the potential effects of some vector, some human vector, whether it's a road or a trail or some activity that's going along, uh, whether that's, uh, you know, edge effects into the forest in terms of um, the warm, dry conditions on the road relative to the interior or potential vectors of invasive species or potential vectors of fire starts from um, accidental fires, things like that. So they can act in that way for sure. Um, and there's lots of research that shows uh, that as a potential vector of um, any of those, those consequences. At the same time, they are also um, in a fire event can be very useful strategic fire breaks, uh, like you alluded to. And so depending on the weather conditions when a fire is burning, um, they can be very effective places to actually hold a fire line, uh, as well as um, really critical for evacuation routes when that's no longer feasible and it's time to get people out of harm's way. So um, it depends, is the, the classic ecological and scientific answer, I would say there. Thank you. I have another two-part question from Gary Room. Uh, 
first part is lodgepole pine typically grows in thick clumps and clusters. Does that have any bearing on the survival rate of these trees during the frequent fires? Yeah, great question. Um, lodgepole pine is, it's a little bit of a different beast than um, ponderosa pine, which I was focusing on. So lodgepole pine, you're right, it grows in thick clumps, it grows in extraordinarily high density. And one of the reasons for that is it, it possesses the trait of serotony. And so when a fire does come, it has the capacity to explode in its population, um, literally and figuratively from the seeds that are released from those closed cones. And so oftentimes in a lodgepole pine forest, um, you might have a stand density of a thousand stems per hectare in an old growth forest or 500 stems per hectare in an old growth forest. And a fire comes through and releases all the seeds from those trees. And then you've got something on the order of, in some cases, 500,000 to a million seeds or seedlings per hectare. Um, and so it grows up in a thicket. In a lodgepole pine forest, that's actually um, pretty much business as usual in terms of that kind of a stand structure. Lodgepole pine has relatively thin bark. And so the fact that it grows in really thick uh, stand structure like that, and therefore is susceptible to burning and dying in a fire, actually is not out of the ordinary for it because rather than survive a fire with thick bark, it has sort of loaded all of its evolutionary adaptation into reseeding following a fire. And so there are some cases certainly where lodgepole pine can survive fire and you do find fire scars on lodgepole pine, but I would say the, the more common mode of reproduction or relationship with fire with lodgepole pine is um, being killed by fire and reproducing by seed immediately following those fires. And that will lead to that really thick uh, population and density. That's fascinating. And the other part of his question was, are there any known mycorrhizal support between the trees? Yeah, um, that is a really, really great question. And I would say is probably one of the key frontiers that certainly is outside of my area of expertise, but there's there are um, lots of really awesome people tackling some questions with mycorrhizae. Um, so I would say the first the first simple answer to that question is yes, it's, it is a really important um, piece and symbiotic relationship of the capacity of a lot of these species to grow and and grow well. Um, there. Yeah, th there are lots of frontiers in terms of understanding that, in terms of how, you know, we, we know that historically in these fire regimes, um, at least presumably those mycorrhizal relationships um, have been well adapted to the fire regime. But as we're seeing fire regimes changing, are those mycorrhizae communities changing as we're seeing combinations of disturbances like um, bark beetles or disease that are followed by fire? Does that change the mycorrhizal communities? I think that there, there are some really interesting frontiers in, in that research that we're just starting to understand. And, and we, I'm using the royal we, that, like I said, that, that's certainly outside of my area of expertise. But um, Suzanne Samard at UBC is um, someone who is a, if you ever get a chance, and if you haven't seen her work or even just Google her name, she's got some really fascinating um, YouTube videos and TED Talk videos about some of her research on mycorrhizal relationships with a lot of our Northwest tree species. I have another question from James Moore. Are the restoration needs mainly on public or private lands or 50-50? Yeah, that is a great question that um, the answer, the exact answer to that question is in the um, tables and appendices of this DeMeo paper, but <clears throat> I would say um, they are, I think just by, by sheer land amount, um, most of them land on public lands. Um, though that's not, they certainly don't exclusively land on public lands. Um, and that among public lands, that's also, um, you know, including federal and state and um, and other public lands as well. But 
I can, I can, if folks are interested, I can send a link to this paper that has those exact numbers. That would be great. I yeah. have another remark. Uh, Lori M refers to uh, Paul Stamets as knowing about the, um, the question you were answering earlier. And then Raylene Gold asks, how is the mountain pine beetle infestation of pine changing the fire regimes? Yeah, I feel like that is a, <laughs> it's a good question. And I, I wanna be mindful of how much, um, it's not something I have slides on, though it is something that I'd be happy to talk for days about, because I actually did my dissertation work on the mountain pine beetle and fire um, interactions in the Rocky Mountains. Um, so it, would it be okay to come back to that one at the end for Q&A? Sure. Q &A? sure. And then okay. um, I have a request to, uh, a couple of requests to um, put the name of the researcher that you referred to in the chat. Oh, yeah. If you could spell it, I can put it in there. I'll just put it in there. There you go. Great. Thank you. Okay, I think that's. Uh, it for um, the questions for the time being. Okay. So let's, let's, I think this is a good point to pivot now to fire on the west side. So um, that east side story, I'm sure, is, is one that folks are, are fairly familiar with. And it's one that um, we hear a lot more about because of the frequency of fire on the east side. Again, when we think about the west side, it's easy for us to get lulled into a sense of complacency about fire because we don't see it as frequently. The, the nature of this fire regime is very different. <clears throat> and so I'm going to focus, uh, as I did on the east side with the poster child of ponderosa pine forest, I'm going to focus on the west side on the poster child forest type of the Douglas fir western hemlock forest. So certainly lots of forests and um, variability across the west side, but imagine just you know, in Washington, at least <clears throat> the kind of uh, lower one third to half of the, the Western Cascade slopes where we're, we're squarely in the Douglas fir Western Hemlock zone here. And on the West side, um, I think Cheryl, you had alluded to uh, <laughs> the Norse Peak fire is one of our, uh, one of the areas I might be talking about. And I just want to highlight um, <laughs> I have to pinch myself that I get to do this for a job and literally um, I'm amazed that I'm so lucky to be able to do this for a job. This is a picture from our Norse Peak Fire study site, uh, which is in the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest just outside of Mount Rainier National Park, which you see in the background here. And this was uh, one of our study fires that burned in uh, 2017 that we're looking at that I'll talk a little bit about shortly here. But west side. Um, imagine we're standing in that spot and again, very different relationship with fire on the west side. Uh, ignitions are, are less so on the west side, though certainly we do have lightning ignitions and certainly there would have been human ignitions, both intentional and unintentional. Um, we've got them currently and they would have been um, dating back for as long as humans have been in the Americas. Uh, However, the weather and climate on the west side, as many of you can imagine, even in the summer, is less conducive to fire in any given summer. And so uh, because of that, we would have had long periods of time between fire events to where fuels or vegetation would not have been limiting when a fire would have come through. In fact, we've got, as many of you are aware of, um, the naturally the, the most biomass rich forests in the world on the west side of the Cascades and our old growth forests are old growth forests because they have lots of time to develop between standard placing events like a fire. And that would have been because we talk about this fire regime on the west side being a weather or climate limited regime as opposed to a fuels or um, vegetation limited regime like we had on the east side. And so what that means is that when fires would have come 
uh, they, the fire regime on the west side is characterized by infrequent and high severity fires when they do come. And I, and I realized this is one of the things that um, across the Western North America, we have fire regimes that operate like this. And it's, it's sometimes crazy for us to imagine this because as a human, a fire like this seems utterly catastrophic and um, hard to imagine that, uh, that organisms in an ecosystem would be adapted to something that would be a high severity event like this. But whether we're talking about um, chaparral in Southern California, lodgepole pine in Yellowstone National Park, or our Western hemlock Douglas fir forest on the west side of the Cascades, uh, there are species that have essentially evolved in these fire regimes that are characterized by infrequent but big and severe fires when they do come through. And so just taking us back to that map that I showed at the beginning, when I say um, infrequent, we're talking about no longer the sort of decades or years to decades between fire events that many ponderosa pine forests on the east side experience, but now we're talking about multiple centuries between fire events in a given patch of forest. And so when those happened, when the fire would come, then uh, you've got 400 years of fuel accumulation in a given stand uh, that is ready to go. And so that, that is not gonna be a limit to uh, this kind of fire activity. And we've got um, paleoecological evidence that suggests that to be the case on the west side. What's, what's challenging is that we do not have that fire scar evidence that we have on the east side, because if all the trees or most of the trees in a fire are dying because that fire is so severe, that evidence of past fires is gonna get erased each time another fire happens. And so we have different ways of constructing um, the likely fire regime on the west side than we do on the east side. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But before we even talk about reconstructing it in the past, uh, we actually have some recent history documentary evidence of large fires on the west side. So some of you may be familiar with the 1902 Yakult burn in Oregon and Washington. And um, if, you know, in and around the Wind River and uh, Cougar, Washington area um, in southern, in the southern Washington Cascades, um, there are plenty of places where you can still see evidence of the Yakult burn today. But again, we've got um, photographs and newspaper coverage of this event where in a period of less than 48 hours, this fire burned more than 500,000 acres on the west side of the Cascades in Oregon and Washington, mostly during the second week in September. So remember that fact for a second here, but um, clearly we don't have satellite records going back there. And so we've got hand-drawn maps of the approximate perimeter of that fire uh, that are um, constructed from lots of different pieces of evidence, but you can see a fairly large area that was affected by that fire. And within that fire, lots and lots of large patches of full stand replacement, high severity fire. Um, all trees within this view, at least, were killed by that fire, other than maybe a few patches you can see way off in the distance that may have survived it. So we've got evidence of this happening in the recent record. If you go back further in time, um, like Miles Henstrom and Jerry Franklin did a couple decades ago um, in Mount Rainier National Park, we don't have those fire scar records on trees, but we do have evidence that um, trees over wide swaths of areas established at around the same time. And often you can find charcoal evidence of the fire that predated those trees. And so what Miles and Jerry did in this project <clears throat> is mapped those patches of contiguous um, even age stands of forests across different time periods in Mount Rainier National Park and came up with a fire history uh, and fire rotation estimate of about 450 years between fire events in a given patch of forest for Mount Rainier National Park. So that's very close to our North Peak um, 2017 fire. And it's kind of a nice benchmark of what we think the fire regime probably was in, in these locations. Um, okay, so in a fire regime like that, 
historically, the forest structure probably looked something like this. Uh, this is an old growth forest on the west side of the Cascades, um, a scene familiar, I'm sure, to many of us here. And uh, if we saw something like this on the east side, we'd say, holy smokes, we've got way too much fuel and biomass here. The fire must have been excluded for a long time. We've got effects of fire suppression, yada, yada, yada. On the west side, um, it's important to remember that that's not the case at all. This would have been very normal forest structure. And in fact, again, we wouldn't have the amazing old growth forests that we know and love that look like this on the west side if that wasn't something that had occurred over long periods of time in terms of large amounts of biomass building up between fire events. And so instead of trying to survive those fires, like uh, ponderosa pine tree will do through multiple fire events over its lifetime on the east side, on the west side, the main adaptation to fire is to reseed following fire. And in fact, interestingly enough, if you look in this old growth forest, which is characterized by very large Douglas fir trees and smaller cedar and hemlock trees, you would not find a single Douglas fir tree um, that is not dominating in the canopy and that is younger than a few hundred years old because they cannot reproduce in their own shade in the same way um, some of these shade tolerant trees do. So that right there tells us that Douglas fir is likely going to capitalize on a fire event because that it's a relatively shade intolerant species. And oftentimes we find Douglas fir's greatest regeneration opportunity like this one year old seedling in the North Peak fire comes following a standard placing fire or other, some other standard placing disturbance that also clears the substrate and, and opens up the growing space. And so this is a one-year-old Douglas fir tree in the Norse Peak fire that um, is very well adapted to this kind of condition, this uh, high light open growing condition following a standard placing fire um, and came from a nearby seed source, probably outside of this burn patch from a seed that blew in there, or potentially from seeds on a tree that was injured and later killed by the fire, but was able to drop its seeds uh, at the time shortly following that fire. And when we think about the effects of uh, management on land use on the west side over the last 100 years, rather than fire suppression being the main uh, land use change or, or management change where fire suppression led to increases in biomass, we have had a different dominant land use on the west side of logging. And that has probably, if anything, led to lower overall biomass um, and lower total fuel loads on the west side than there would have been otherwise without this management. However, again, we're not in a fuel limited system. So the relative contribution of that potential reduction in fuel from logging in terms of its effect on the fire regime um, is not the same as what we think about the increase in fuel from fire suppression on, on the east side. And when we think about um, changes to forest structure and fire risk on the west side, uh, we have, probably been sitting with the same level of fire risk on the west side for a very long time that we're currently sitting with today. There's not a, there's not strong evidence that the, the fire regime on the west side of the Cascades has departed a whole lot from its historical regime. And so the changes to forest structure and fire risk are probably not um, very strong. Doesn't mean that they're not there. They certainly are there, but they're not, the changes are not very strong from what we would have seen historically on the west side. And the fires that we see today on the west side, such as those that, that occurred um, in September, are probably, as, as crazy as this might sound, um, but when we think about the, the Oregon and Washington Cascades, particularly northern Oregon and into Washington, these fires that burned this last summer are probably not outside of the range of what we would expect normally in this fire regime. And the reason why I say that is it's uncanny, the timing of this event. During the same exact week that the Yakult fire burned 118 years prior, the fires were burning in uh, Southern Washington and Northern Oregon and burned about eight 
100,000 acres on the west side of the Cascades over about a 48 hour period, mostly during the second week in September. So there is certainly historical precedent for these sorts of fire events to happen. And it really is the, the what we call in one of our papers um, led by Josh Walowski and Dan Nato, it's the nature of the beast of these fires and the fire regime on the, the west side of the Cascades. It's a very different uh, situation than we have on the east side. And so the, the fires that we see today are probably not that um, outside of the range of historical variability. And here's one of our study sites in the Norse Peak Fire, a standard placing fire. In this shot, we only see a green canopy of one of these trees way far away off in the distance here. 100% um, mortality over a patch like this would have been well within the natural fire regime in this system. And the species are fairly well adapted to respond to regenerate. And so the post-fire succession story is one that we've, we've got a lot of research that we're looking at right now on the, um, in some of these study sites on the west side of the Cascades. We've, we've essentially been setting up a series of long-term monitoring plots um, immediately following fire in the recent fires that have happened. And we're tracking fire, or sorry, forest dynamics as they come back through time. And so this is the Norse Peak Fire, one year post-fire, three years post-fire, and this is the Goodell Creek Fire up in North Cascades National Park, five years post-fire. And it is mind-blowing how fast these things bounce back. By five years post-fire, we are um, extraordinarily rich in terms of species diversity, in terms of herbaceous shrub and tree diversity, in terms of what's coming back. and um, likely what we're seeing in some of these areas is essentially the the starting points of if given enough time what would eventually become an old growth forest again these were in old growth forests when they burned at least this this photograph was this was in younger forests when it burned but um, we're seeing plenty of post-fire tree regeneration even in the few years following these fires and of douglas fir um, but but also western hemlock and western red cedar and silver fir and um, other species that we're, we're seeing come back here. So we've got a long road to go to understand how these things are going to be coming back. And we're also looking at um, not just the trees, but the other species and particularly some culturally important plants um, with some of our, our partners on this project. Um, but we've got a long time to be able to tell this whole story of how these forests respond to fire in real time. So closing up this part here, um, I just want to state that it's really important, but it's something that is easy to gloss over. Uh, the differences between the east side and the west side forests in Washington and their relationship with fire. And one way to think about that, as we, we put in this paper in 2018, is that in an east side forest, 80 years without fire suppression, we'd, we'd have that image that I showed you earlier that looks kind of like what it looked like at time zero because that fire regime has been in place, but 80 years with fire suppression and we've got ourselves into the pickle that we're in today. On the west side, uh, sometimes you might hear that, oh, fire suppression is to blame for the, for the fires that we're seeing on the west side. Um, and that's probably uh, not true and, and not very well supported by the, um, the evidence because it, as you can imagine in a fire regime that has 300, and 400, 300 to 400 years between fire events naturally in a given patch of forest, if we've suppressed fire for that amount of time, uh, we may or may not have even missed a single fire. Whereas here, we, we potentially could have missed five fires easily in that time period and all that fuel that would have been removed. But here, fire suppression, the, the length of time of effective fire suppression relative to the return interval of fires is actually a pretty small window of time. And so the effect of fire suppression on changing the fire regimes on the west side is um, is likely negligible. Okay, quick time check here. I know I know we've 
we've uh, let's see, we're at. I've got one last section, which is kind of the climate change, um, what to expect section here. But um, any any questions or um, there are a couple of questions this? before we make the transition. Uh, Regina Johnson would like to know how long do Douglas fir seeds last in the seed bank? Yeah, great question. And it's a pretty, pretty straightforward answer and that it's actually um, little to no time. Um, they, they, whereas uh, lodgepole pine can maintain that canopy seed bank and those serotonous cones and maintain that for a very long time or some shrubs, you know, in very long time, I mean like multiple decades in lodgepole pine, some shrubs can have uh, soil seed banks that can last over a hundred years until a fire comes through. Douglas fir actually um, doesn't have any uh, permanence to its seed bank. And so once those seeds are shed out of cones, um, they either germinate or not. And if they don't germinate and establish um, that there's not really much of a seed bank with Douglas fir. So another question is, how different is forest cover in the Doug fir, shore pine, Gary Oak areas now than it was while native peoples were managing the land? Yeah, um, great question. And while that is, it's outside of the focus of the area that I was just talking about, um, it, it is probably the area that there is much stronger evidence on the west side of, um, first off, a very active role that indigenous peoples have played in that fire regime for a very long time in terms of um, keeping those areas more open structure with intentionally introduced fire. Um, and then consequentially is also probably the area on the west side <clears throat> where we have seen the most effect of um, the last 150 years in, ter in terms of the change of the fire regime under um, the, the, the management regime and fire suppression over the last 150 years um, to where those, those areas are much more at risk than they would have been historically and are much more limited on the landscape. Um, they also happen to coincide with a lot of the areas where we've got the highest popula um, contemporary population densities and built structures um, on the west side. And so some of those areas uh, have been converted in terms of land use and, and then others have been, um, the forest composition has changed uh, and become less dominated by things like uh, Gary Oak than they would have been historically. And, yeah. Okay, and then Marla Tulio says, so are we due for a major fire west of the Cascades or are we just always suppressed? What a great question. Uh, I'll get a little bit into that, into the what, what to expect in a warming world though, not maybe as explicitly as I can with an answer right now, which is um, on the west side of the Cascades, uh, it's not necessarily true to say we're due because things happen like clockwork and you know in, in any given patch that hasn't burned in 450 or 750 years that it's going to happen next year or the year following. Um, there's actually um, lots of precedent for areas that have burned in the last few years or decades um, to burn perhaps just as likely as an area that hasn't burned for 100 years on the west side. Again, because it's less of a fuel limited regime. So the main thing that is gonna drive fire activity on the west side is uh, warm, dry weather conditions, those east wind events like we saw, uh, which are our version of the Santa Ana winds this, this far up on the coast, um, but similar to the Santa Ana winds in terms of the, the role that they play in the fire regime like they do in Southern California, and then an ignition on the landscape. And so I would say any summer where we've got those combinations of uh, a warm dry period enough to dry out the fuels and ignition on the landscape that has even a small fire or even um, you know a, a, you know a very very small fire any sort of ignition on the landscape and then those winds kick up and sustain for a period of time 
those are the ingredients that when they align, uh, we should be on high alert for fire on the west side of the Cascades because we know it's happened in the past. We saw it happen in Oregon and a little bit in Washington this past year. Um, and we've seen little kind of um, smaller versions of that in, in even the last five years with the Eagle Creek fire and the Norse Peak fire. Um, but fortunately those east wind events weren't as sustained as the, the ones we saw this year. So I have a couple more questions. Kevin Kane says on a given site, you can either have fewer large big trees or many small trees, but the overall biomass would be about the same. Um, that is, yeah, sorry, was that, is that a question or? A, a... Yeah, he, yeah, he ends it with a question mark. So he's wondering okay. if fewer large big trees or many small trees equate to the same rough biomass? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, and in fact, yeah, there, there are some pretty um, consistent uh, sort of uh, site, site index or maximum site productivity curves that you could find for um, any given patch of forest. And essentially, if you planted a bunch of seeds, we see this, like, for example, with lodgepole pine, those million seedlings per hectare that I talked about, they obviously can't stay a million seedlings per hectare forever and they will self thin and at some point reach the sort of peak biomass where um, they are no longer um, able to sustain that density and so they'll start to thin out and, and, es and essentially ride that um, same biomass as the population gets smaller, but each tree individually gets bigger as it is out competing its neighbor. Okay, I have a few more questions, but my, in the interest of time, why don't we go on to your third section and we'll see how much time we have after that. Okay, sounds great. These are great questions and thanks for, um, for sticking Sticking with it here. Okay, so what to expect in a, in a warming world. So um, I'm not gonna go through the, the basics of this, but I think it suffice to say the planet is warming and fire activity is increasing. Um, if you are paying attention to the, the news almost on an annual basis, we're breaking um, records in both of these metrics in, in lots of places around the, the globe and certainly um, decadal trends show that both of these things are increasing. And so what do we know about heat, drought, and fire? Um, in some ways it boils down to pretty simple relationships and I'm just going to show you uh, over the western United States, this is a a paper by Leroy Westerling from a few years back, <clears throat> but the trends continue and it's, a, it's sort of a nice illustrative example here, is that over the last few decades, we've seen an increase in the temperature anomaly from some baseline condition that was um, at least set as baseline of uh, the beginning of this study time. So increasing temperatures and a very tightly corresponding increase in fire activity, which are the red bars here. Um, and in many studies, that is, that's a very high correlation, something like a, an R square of, of 0.7 or 0.8. So lots of, the number one um, driver of area burned in this part of the world is warm, dry conditions. And that is true in the paleo record, that's true in the contemporary record. And basically comes down to some pretty simple pieces where the earlier, the, the warmer and drier conditions we have, the earlier spring snow melt comes. Um, this is another metric here, basically lengthens the time that fuels are available to burn in these forests that we have. And there are plenty of fuels available to burn when they're warm and dry and, and easy to ignite. And all of that um, boils down to, at least on this version on the North American scale, the length of the fire season expanding over time. So the width of this polygon here is in the day of the year on this axis here, the, the time from the first discovery of a fire to the last discovery of the fire is the red to red. And then this black sliver is to the last control of the fire. And so 
as we go on in time, the width of this polygon is getting longer or wider and wider, which is essentially telling us the fire season is lengthening um, on average over these last several decades. And, uh, and in many parts of the world, that has been about a two week increase on average <clears throat> uh, over the last several decades in terms of the fire season starting earlier and ending later each year. And so climate change is not to blame for fires solely. Certainly there were fires in these forests are fire adapted and fire played a critical role in these ecosystems long before the recent climate change that we've seen. However, one way to think about it is that it's loading the dice. If we boil this down pretty simply to the ingredients for fire to occur, we need fuels, we need ignitions, we need hot dry conditions. And if you kick winds into the equation, it just kicks everything into overdrive. We've had fuels and we will have fuels as long as we have um, flammable vegetation and native ecosystems around us. Um, we've had ignitions for a very long time and we will continue to have ignitions both intentional and unintentional for a very long time. Uh, and winds are, are always gonna play a factor in this. And so if we've got those three ingredients around and we are increasing the hot dry conditions, we're essentially loading that die in this game of four dice that need to come up uh, in terms of fire activity for a given year. And so one way to think about it is it's not to blame for fire activity. It would be around without climate change, but it is loading the die in the favor of increased fire potentials as we're seeing continued warm and dry conditions, as long as these other ingredients are still there in sufficient supply. And again, this is um, a, a paper uh, showing worldwide this trend that I just showed you from the Westerling et al. paper of the increase in fire uh, activity, just showing it's certainly variable around the world, but in the western half of the United States and in other regions around the world where there's big increases in fire activity, we're seeing that the fire uh, season length increase by about two weeks globally, and that is more profound in some areas than in other areas. Um, one important piece to consider in all of this as well is um, the role that human-caused climate change is ha having in this. And, and in a study by John Abotsiglu and Park Williams in 2016, they basically took the approach that a lot of the, um, uh, the IPCC climate uh, summit work has done with attributing how much climate change that we've seen is, is uh, attributed to human caused emissions. And they said, okay, if we took the human caused chunk of climate change, how much are humans in terms of that climate change signal um, playing a role in the increase in, in fire activity? And essentially, I don't wanna get down in the weeds of these uh, graphs here, but the, the main takeaway here is that without any anthropogenic climate change fuel aridity, we would have seen an increase in fire activity over the last few decades at this black line here. But instead we've seen this line here in terms of the increase in uh, fire activity and fuel aridity. And so that's essentially a doubling of the fire activity that we would have seen without the human caused portion of climate change in the last several decades. Or in other words, human caused climate change is responsible for about half of the increase in fire activity that we've seen. So uh, as long as the climate is continuing to warm, we should not be surprised that fire activity is going to correspondingly increase. Um, very simply just that the, the ingredients are there and that's one key ingredient and we are essentially continuing to turn that dial up. How is this unfolding? Um, in California, for example, uh, this is crazy. I've used this slide over the last few years and I have to update it every single year because there's a new record being broken in California for something like area burned. And area burned, as I mentioned before, very strongly responds to climate as its key driver. In December of 2018, December, so the period between uh, Thanksgiving and New Year's, California had at that point recorded its largest fire in, 
in recorded history of 115,000 hectares in the Thomas Fire by Ventura. That record held for exactly nine months <clears throat> until August 2018 when the Mendocino complex in Northern California um, almost doubled that record. And then that record held for exactly two years until it was broken um, by the August complex, which was almost half a million hectares in California this last summer. And uh, two other fires broke the Thomas fire record from a few years ago. And so not only are we breaking records in terms of fire years each year, but we're, we're shattering records and having multiple new fire events break um, records that were set just a few years ago. And again, uh, there has historically been lots of fire on these landscapes. Fire is not something that is new, but climate change is, is, is making it harder and harder for us to keep a lid on the boiling pot of fire activity is one way to think about it. Um, we've been able to keep a lid on fire activity before the climate has recently warmed through lots of the things that you know, we've learned have, have also contributed to the problem like fire suppression. Um, but now it's getting harder and harder to sort of keep that under wraps as the climate continues to warm. And there are so many dimensions beyond what I've talked about here that, are, um, that really are catastrophic and tragic from a societal standpoint, whether it is um, loss, of, loss of property, loss of life, um, the human health impacts from smoke, many, many, many dimensions that are felt unevenly across our human society in addition to the ecological impacts here. And so I'll just wrap up really quick and then um, open it up for, for some final questions here. On the ecological end, um, not only is climate change changing the fire re regimes in, in some locations, um, it's also changing the way that forests are responding to fire. And so I've done a lot of work. I'm going to take us on a quick virtual tour out to Yellowstone real quick. And I've done a lot of work. Um, my dissertation research was in the Rocky Mountains, um, largely focused on lodgepole pine. And so this is the species, again, following the 1988 fires, which many of you may remember. Uh, that fire was a million acres, huge fire. That forest bounced back like that because it had those serotonous cones in mature trees that burned and there was plenty of seed available and you had millions of seedlings per hectare in some of these areas all naturally reseeded following the 88 Yellowstone fires. We're starting to see some of those areas now reburn way quicker than they would have historically and one example of that is in the Maple Fire in 2016 which reburned um, about 18,000 hectares of the Yellowstone fire in forests that were pretty young because they were just regenerating still following the 88 fires. And when those trees burned, um, some of the areas that burned looked like this, where the trees themselves were consumed, the logs that were down were consumed. Um, that quick succession reburn in a system that is not necessarily adapted to it uh, resulted in a very different post-fire vegetation succession trajectory here. It's, <clears throat> it's unclear. Um, how this is going to respond, clearly it's different than how this responded in 1988 with very high seedling densities, but um, it could be years, it could be decades, it could be longer until some of these really severely uh, double burned areas um, start to come back as a logical pine forest like they looked like prior to and following the 88 Yellowstone fires. Uh, Moving a little bit closer to the kind of forest we see in eastern Washington, um, we're seeing lots of evidence of severe fire that is followed by dry conditions, warm dry conditions at the lower tree line. So imagine now um, out by like, for example, a place like Ellensburg, Washington, or in this case, this was at the lower tree line outside of Yellowstone National Park where Douglas fir forests um, transitioned into sagebrush and grasslands <clears throat> where, where you're sort of comfortably in the zone of uh, interior Douglas fir and you have a fire, uh, you've got plenty of regeneration today because you're still comfortably in the climate zone of what is suitable for, for Douglas fir. However, at that lower tree line edge, at that marginal forest um, 
when you have a fire now, in many cases, the post-fire climate is not conducive to regeneration of that same tree species. And if you're at the lower forest edge, that may mean a transition from forest to non-forest, which is what we saw in some of these areas that, whether that's a permanent transition or not, um, several decades following fire in some of the interior dry forests on that low tree forest edge have yet to come back with any tree establishment. And so we're seeing some forest contraction at that lower margin throughout many dry forests in the interior west. And then I'll just end on um, back on the west side to say that it's really unclear whether or not we're going to be seeing big shifts following fire on the west side uh, in the same ways that we're seeing in, in the more dry and interior locations. Certainly in some of those dry and interior locations, we know that the climate conditions now are not conducive to the tree species that were there pre-fire. On the west side, we're a little bit more buffered from that, and we're and we're not as close to the forest non-forest margin in a lot of these areas. But we don't know. And uh, one of the one of the pretty exciting things about this research opportunity that we're working on is there haven't been many fires on the west side of the Cascades, um, certainly in the last several decades of a very notable size to be able to study this until recently. And so um, we're in some ways kind of on the we've got a front row seat to looking at how these forests are going to be responding to fire and how that's going to play out over the next um, several centuries. So we're just the, the first part in this relay, relay race of uh, tracking these forests through time and some of these permanent plots here. But I can say from Norse Peak and Goodell uh, fire in Washington, um, we do see some signs that these things are bouncing back um, in, in pretty exciting and interesting ways following at least recent fires. All right, what does it all mean? Fire, such a critical disturbance that shapes forests in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's been here for a really long time. It's gonna be here for a really long time. Uh, really, really important for all of us, even myself as a fire ecologist to, to sort of humbly sit back and say, wow, okay, fire is a dominant shape that has forced this, uh, dominant force that has shaped this landscape for a very long time. And there is a lot that we still don't understand about it, um, but it certainly has been around for a long time. East side versus the west side of the Cascades, totally different stories, totally different um, forests and their adaptations to fires and likely different trajectories in terms of where things are going in the future, both as a result of our past management decisions, as well as um, climate change in those contexts. And then finally, uh, with a warming climate, we should, honestly, um, at this point, we should be surprised if fire activity does not continue to increase. That's the most logical outcome of a continually warming climate. And so um, having our finger on the pulse of what is happening and how that's changing, how forests are coming back following fires is, is really important. And some of those changes are certainly underway, underway, particularly in the interior and drier forest ecosystems. And with that, I want to say thanks. I know this has been a little bit of a marathon talk, but the questions have been fantastic all the way through. And I really appreciate um, everyone sticking it out. So thank you and happy to take any questions and a quick acknowledgement to my collaborators and um, funders here at the bottom of this slide. Great. I do have a few questions, plus some thank yous coming through in the chat. But here's some questions. What is key to maintaining, uh, <coughs> excuse me, what is key to maintaining forests around communities in Western Washington to protect settlements? Assuming reducing fuel load wouldn't necessarily prevent high severity fires. Yeah, um, another among a list of fantastic questions here. So on the east side and in these dry forests, that's where fuel reduction and getting the forest back into a reduced fuel state that it historically would have been in is, is clearly um, the, you know, one of the main answers. I will say on the west side in our, in our wetter forests that have the, the more um, infrequent but, but severe fire regime, uh, broad scale 
fuel reduction strategies don't make a whole lot of sense just because of how quickly things would grow back and the fact that we're not in a fuel limited system. At the same time, fuel uh, reduction around structures and around potential ignition points is always a really key thing to do. And so whether that's around neighborhoods, whether that's around um, utility corridors, whether that's around um, places where people will be uh, traveling or recreating, things like that, um, being able to minimize the potential for ignition is one thing that can actually result from fuel reduction strategies in and around where people are going to be. And, and the home ignition zone in any fire regime is a really critical piece for safety. So um, I would say whether that's on the east side or the west side, um, you know, minimizing the chance that an ember from a fire that is not right next to your home might actually minimize the chance that it might actually start a fire on your property by clearing the fuel around your home is always a good idea, uh, no matter what fire regime you're in. That being said, as like fuel fuel reduction treatments are by no means a, a panacea on the west side, and um, some of my colleagues uh, talk about this a lot in the way that we think about earthquakes actually on the west side. Um, and it's it might sound like a little bit of a stretch at first, but in some ways there are a lot of, a lot of parallels. Um, we know that they're coming. When they do come, there's only so, so much we can do to um, resist the uh, severe effects from them. And what we need to be prepared for is emergency management, getting people out of harm's way and um, making sure that we are able to adapt following these disturbances. And uh, as long as there are uh, forests in many of these ecosystems, that, that uh, risk of disturbance from fire is probably not going to be going away anytime soon. And it's only going to be more challenging to deal with as we have a warmer and drier um, climate conditions. Okay, um, Raylian Gold is wondering, in the Norse Peak fire, it looks like the fire, at least near the road, jumped around creating patches that aren't touched. Did that help the forest floor plant regeneration that looks great at three years? Yeah, you know, oh, that is such an awesome question. Um, I love that question because one of my, one of my research focal areas that, that kind of fascinates me is how much uh, heterogeneity, if you will, or variability in the burn mosaic there is, even in really large fires. And so the same would be true for the 1988 Yellowstone fires. Those fires were tremendously um, heterogeneous in the mosaic and how they burned across that 1 million acres. North Peak, same thing. And so, yeah, you're, you're spot on. Um, with uh, that variability in the burns, the, the burn severity mosaic is really critical. So when we say, you know, the Norris Peak fire burned um, more than 10,000 hectares on the west side of the Cascades, I think a lot of us might quickly go to like, oh my God, that whole 10,000 hectares has got to look like a homogenous moonscape of blackened forest. And that can't be farther from the truth in most burned forests. Certainly there can be large patches of standard placing fire, but um, even in some of the largest fires that we've seen in the Western United States over the documentary record, uh, very few locations are extremely far from seed sources because the, the mosaic of burn severity is pretty variable across space. And so, yeah, those are critical seed sources for regeneration. Um, and so far in our Norse Peak studies, we found uh, in our plots that we've set out there, uh, most of them are within at, at most a few hundred meters from the nearest unburned patch. And that, believe it or not, is plenty of distance for a lot of these seeds to travel into the burned forest. And certainly most areas are actually um, a lot closer than that. Okay, thank you. Um, John Hastings wants to know, is there evidence to suggest 
some of these record shattering fires, our biome shift and the forests are unlikely to regenerate. Yeah, it, um, it, it's tough to tell. It, it, I feel like that is, um, that question is the core of uh, a, lot of, a lot of our research efforts right now. It's sort of like, how far can these systems be pushed before they would no longer be resilient and shift into something else? Um, I think that is a major concern right now because of the, <clears throat> the kind of fire activity, particularly in places like California, um, where there were fires. It's, I, I will say like, it's not actually the area burn that is the most alarming number, believe it or not, even though those area burn numbers are, are pretty dramatic. Um, we know actually historically uh, there were plenty of years where that amount of area likely burned. It, it had to, to be able to support those fire regimes and those adaptations. The more alarming piece is uh, not the area burned, but how much of that burned severely and how much of that burned severely in homogeneous patches of high severity. So going back to the last question, um, We've, we've seen this heterogeneity be a really key mechanism of resilience in many fires, fire after fire after fire. Uh, but there is a big concern, in, in, you know, particularly in some of the fires in California um, where they made big runs and, were, and created high severity patches. <clears throat> a lot of the concern from colleagues in California is some of those patches are now sort of outside the range of what those forests would have been able to to tolerate in terms of reseeding. And so they may be shifts from, um, in some cases, ponderosa pine forests to oak woodlands or, or chaparral oak uh, mixtures because those species are gonna be able to deal with that kind of a new fire regime in a, in a different way. So, in, I mean, in some ways, fire um, is facilitating or catalyzing these climate driven shifts in vegetation um, because there's a lagged effect in these long-lived organisms like trees to just the direct effects of climate change but then you have climate change then triggered with a big fire and now you've got a post-fire environment that may support a, a totally different vegetation or you know some some different vegetation community and so Finding when, where, and why, and how those areas are, are playing out is a, is a big piece of um, the focus of our, of our research and certainly colleagues in California who are looking at this. Thank you. Um, here's a local question. When the local crit critical areas ordinance makes tree removal extremely restrictive and replanting at three times the number of trees removed is public policy creating a higher fire risk? That's a, it's a tricky question to answer because I think, it, um, I mean, it certainly seems like it could in some areas, um, but it would, it would probably vary depending on what the, um, the existing fuel structure is and what the existing fire regime is. Um, it's a good question. I'd be happy to follow up uh, with whoever's question that is and see if I could um, find a better, more specific answer to that, because it, it would depend on context, I think, a little bit. Okay, that was Terry Samuelson, and he can um, probably find you on the UW website. Yeah, that'd be great. And actually, just to point it out to folks, um, my, yeah, my website and also my email address are on here. I would say feel free to, to send any questions my way. I'm more than happy to answer them if I can or, or point you in the direction if I can. Great, I got two more for tonight. Um, we, do we know the impact to the living forest from the fires that have included homes burnt with toxic materials released and the winds have blown these toxic chemicals and acidic smoke into these living forests? and do we have processes and tools to capture this impact? 
A really good question that I don't have an answer to off the top of my head, but um, I can I can point to so one a colleague of mine at UW Ernesto Alvarado um, does a lot more with smoke uh, and studies smoke than I do and smoke produced by wildfires. Um, I can. If somebody wants to email me about that, I can put you in touch with Ernesto. I think that that's a really good question, but I, I'm afraid I don't have a good answer off the top of my head for that one. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Shelly Evans asks, uh, I realize that this is hard to comment on given the short-term duration of most studies, but what about the ability of species that are close, closely associated with old growth and may only occur in very old forest and their ability to reestablish and regenerating forest? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, there certainly is some crossover, I can say already <clears throat> from what we've seen uh, in the first few years following fires in our existing plots. And what I mean by that crossover is we do see um, a lot of the same species that we see in the old growth forests, because we in all of these studies, we have the burned plots as well as um, control unburned plots where we ins install them in areas that didn't burn in that same fire. And many of those are old growth forests still today. Um, and so we can actually you know compare the species of sandwiches and the unburned to the recently burned and look at how those changed through time. We do see some crossover, though we also see um, many early seral or early successional species that we haven't seen for a really long time in the mature to old growth forests because they uh, can't reproduce and persist in those environments. And so there is, there's actually <clears throat> um, a really important um, counterpoint to the to the importance of the biodiversity that is supported by old growth forests and that these early seral forests right after a disturbance and particularly a natural disturbance like a severe fire uh, this is this is a stage of forest development that is really critically important for supporting biodiversity and actually uh, there is typically, greatest biodiversity, greater biodiversity in the early seral, um, recently disturbed forests than there is in old growth. It's not, not the same species all of the time, um, but in terms of just total number of species, there is typically greater biodiversity in the recently disturbed forests. Purely as an artifact of that disturbance is a destructive forest, certainly, but also creates all of this opportunity by opening up the growing space, and particularly for shade intolerant species um, that would otherwise get outcompeted in an old growth or mature forest, that's sort of their time to shine. And so um, the, the biodiversity is, is really astounding in um, recently disturbed forests. And that, that goes for other natural disturbances. I mean, the Mount St. Helens research uh, over the last several decades has shown really surprising and um, pretty astounding results of how much biodiversity is supported by a really crazy severe disturbance like the Mount St. Helens eruption. And so fires are just another flavor of that in terms of an opportunity that creates a lot of opportunities for biodiversity. Okay, and then this is just about the last question. Roger Brewer, says, I think you said half the increase in forest fires is from increase in temperatures. What is the cause of the other half of the increase? Yeah, so in the, the Abbasa glue and Williams paper, so essentially um, one way to think about that is <clears throat> the, yeah, the increase in fire activity that we've seen is a product of many different drivers. Um, some of them are natural fluctuations in climate that we would have seen without human-caused climate change. 
Some of them are just the available fuel that's out there. Some of them are, um, you know, any combinations of factors that drive fires. So basically the, uh, we, one way to boil this down is <clears throat> if you take, if you erase the human caused climate change over the last several decades, we would have seen an increase in fire activity from all those other drivers combined, including natural climate variability. But the human caused add on to climate warming essentially has doubled that, that trend over the last several years or doubled that increase in fire activity that we would have otherwise naturally seen from other factors alone. Okay, actually, um, what? One really good final question. Uh, is there a book that could explain these things in simple terms to share with kids? <laughs> oh, I'm sure there is out there. That is a really good question. And I don't know if some of you saw my five-year-old son was in the background um, because he, he likes to listen to this stuff. And I'm always thinking about that question. And there are, there are some really good books out there. I, if you, if you send me an email, I know of actually one really good one in Australia um, that I got when I was visiting some colleagues on a project in Australia. Also, a landscape that is no stranger to fire. Um, I, being a, a father of a five-year-old, almost six-year-old kindergartner right now, um, I've got some sort of stored away in here. There are also some really good PBS cartoon episodes that do a really good job of um, breaking down some of these fire ecology concepts. Wild, wild Crafts and Dinosaur Train are two that uh, my, my son particularly likes. And I know they've had good episodes over the last couple of years. So if you, if you send me an email, I'll, I'll happily send you what I know, but also um, we can team up on searching for things or, or maybe, maybe team up on, on doing a project like that in the future, that would be fun. Sounds great. Well, I, I have no more questions. Um, Debbie, who asked about the book, is saying great. Um, so just to repeat, this presentation was recorded and it will be on our website at wnps.org uh, by tomorrow night. Um, whoopsie, I see one final question here. Oh no, it's a thank you from Shelly Evans. Got lots of thank yous in the chat too. Great, yeah, well thank uh, you, this was awesome.